Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our third chapter, Emile Durkheim. Often, we compare Durkheim with Karl Marx. Durkheim saw the same changes, shifts, the same movement in Europe towards industrialization, the same new and startling social arrangements, and the sharp split with the past that living in cities and working in factories wrought in the 19th century. But he came to a very different conclusion than did Marx. For Durkheim, the task of analysis was not to affect revolutionary change, but to study social facts. Why? Durkheim saw social stability or social cohesion as the optimum condition for humans to flourish in advanced capitalist societies. Durkheim, then, is the grandfather of the functional school in social thought, whereas Marx is the progenitor of all theoretical perspectives focusing. To this end, Durkheim thought, that the central purpose of social analysis was to analyze social facts, conditions and circumstances external to the individual that determine the individual's actions. Remember the traffic light example from the first chapter. So sociology, a term coined by a man, Auguste Comte, who had similar thoughts to Durkheim, was concerned with social facts. A social fact is irreducible. That is, there is not a psychological or biological reality that can explain it. The need for order, that red light example that I use, is a social fact. There is no biology that forces people to stop at a red light. There is not an individual psychological reality in and of itself that explains why everyone conforms to this rule. Even the fear of being arrested or in a crash is predicated a priori, that's a fancy Latin term for before, the fear is there. And it comes from a social source. You have to learn to fear. Durkheim was also concerned with social solidarity. This is exactly opposite of Marx's concern. Social solidarity is the cohesion or hanging together or the proper functioning of social groups. Durkheim studied labor with different conclusions than Marx. He studied religious life, and he studied why there had been an alarming increase in suicide in the 1870s in Western Europe. All of these were with an eye to exploring the nature of the bonds that hold individuals and social groups together. For Durkheim, the movement of people away from the countryside and into cities had created an impersonal world. He had found in his research on suicide that communities that were rural, where people knew one another, where they went to the same churches and basically were all farmers, the suicide rates were lower. They had a sense of shared social reality, rules, and beliefs. When people moved into impersonal cities, though, there was a, sen there was a sense of anime, a word that means essentially normlessness. There was no center by Durkheim. People in traditional communities had a sense of likeness. Durkheim termed this mechanical solidarity, or people being rooted in a sense that they are doing and feeling similar things. But this 
was lost, or there was a danger of it being lost, to complexity. In more complex social arrangements, Durkheim theorized that there was a different type of solidarity that emerges or needs to emerge. He called this organic solidarity. Each person is interdependent with others, but individual differences are cultivated. People get a sense of groundedness when they feel as if they are doing their part for the good of the whole. We're dependent on people who know stuff that we don't know doctors and mechanics. I, for example, am getting ready to go have the serpentine belt replaced by some excellent mechanics here in central Kentucky who I work with. Why? I can't do that myself. So this solidarity, according to Durkheim, comes from a feeling of interdependence, not of the sameness. Another arena of consciousness and cohesiveness for Durkheim was religious life. Durkheim was not concerned with what religion had as its content. It's not a value judgment here, but how it functioned in society. Durkheim classified anything that had to do with a religious aspect of life as sacred. Durkheim is concerned with the function of religion. The function of religion is to code the system of relations of the group through the use of religious symbols, for example, a cross. A religious symbol is a marker that stands for something else. And rituals. Rituals are a routinized act that is collective, symbolic, and sacred. Finally, for Durkheim, the cohesion that religious life brought came through the delineation of what he called the sacred, those symbols and rituals associated with that religious experience set apart from the everyday world and what he termed the profane or everyday life. Please make a note as you're reading that the word profane here does not mean saucy language or taking the Lord's name in vain. It means everyday life. Religion, by establishing the boundaries between the sacred and the profane, clarifies in functions to ensure the solidarity of people involved in the religious group.